So last week and the week before, I've been talking about a fundamental answer to a question that very reasonably concerns us at the beginning of a new year, or at least in countries uh, for which this is now at the beginning of a new year. And I think it's a question that can concern us always, every day, in the present, which is, what is it that leads to happiness for ourselves and others and leads away from suffering for ourselves and others? What is it? Well, uh, as I talked about last week, the Buddha and other great teachers have pointed again and again, as well as others in modern psychology supported by lots of research, that a necessary foundation of lasting happiness, generally speaking, is personal virtuous conduct. Some people kind of get away with it for a while, but usually their not so virtuous conduct catches up with them. So here we have this fundamental emphasis on basically don't be a jerk to yourself or other people that in the language of early Buddhism, Pali is referred to as sila, along with the two other pillars of practice, samadhi and panya. So we have sila, translated usually as morality, ethics, or restraint, samadhi as concentration, and more generally, mental training, the cultivation of wholesome qualities of mind and heart, and panya, wisdom. And we find these three again and again, virtuous conduct, mental training, and wisdom in all kinds of other traditions. Okay. Now, it's really important that we understand virtuous conduct, which might seem kind of fancy, in very down-to-earth ways as basically helping more and harming less others as well as ourselves. And you can see how this is really a foundation of lasting happiness over time. This is not about following a set of rules handed down from on high that would be some kind of uh, fire and brimstone sim, sin to violate. It's not about that. Sila, virtuous conduct, is about pragmatically observing the results of our thoughts, words, and deeds for others and for ourselves and nudging ourselves and tilting others appropriately, increasingly toward, you know, what helps and away from what hurts. This is not about the shoulds landing on us from other people or that we've internalized from our childhood. This is about your own deep sense of integrity and fundamental inherent inner goodness. Now, in my first talk on this topic two weeks ago, the first one of the new year, we explored some specific do's and don'ts that are suggested primarily in the Buddhist tradition. You can judge them on their merits as you see fit. In the second talk last week, we explored broad principles, particularly the broad principle of non-harming, including its specific application of not harming others by not externalizing our costs upon them. Externalizing costs means pushing costs downstream. Examples uh, happen at all scales from, you know, dumping our litter in the street to dumping our anger on others who are the local lightning rods for it. I have some knowledge about doing that myself, certainly in my past, uh, particularly when our kids were young, not good, um, on using my wife as a lightning rod, not our kids. Um, and also other kinds of externalizing costs happen at larger scales, like companies dumping their pollution into rivers to flow downstream, uh, and the powerful few pushing the costs of their wishes onto the many. A clear and enormously important example of externalized costs is the climate crisis, which I talked about last week, and you can take a look at the recording of that. Uh, the costs of fossil fuels and other greenhouse gases are being externalized onto all of us, though particularly on the most vulnerable among us. And then over time, in the generations to come, the costs, externalized costs of what we do in the present are being pushed downstream into the future, landing on our grandchildren and their grandchildren and their grandchildren as well. Now, as we consider the topic of virtuous conduct, which does include questions of morality, ethics, integrity, and guilt, we must face gaps 
between our values and our actions. There is no way around it. Even if it makes us uncomfortable, there is no way around it. If you're not feeling uncomfortable, occasionally at least, as you reflect honestly on the virtues or not of your own actions, your own conduct, you're probably not reflecting deeply enough. This is certainly true for me. Now, to be mindful of any gaps between values and actions, right, between talk and walk, uh, we need self-acceptance and we need self-compassion. It's hard to face these things and it's hard to see them in others while maintaining you know, our equanimity in the process, hopefully. It's hard to do that. We need compassion. We need kindness. We need acceptance. Additionally, particularly for ourselves, we must face the past, but mainly we should focus on the present and the future, you know, rather than beating ourselves up about what has happened and what cannot be changed. And all this is really important if you're vulnerable. And some people have written me after my last talk about this, and I appreciate their input. If you're particularly vulnerable to shaming yourself or beating yourself up or internalizing the, mm, the criticisms and attacks of others, it's especially important to mobilize self-acceptance and self-compassion and a focus on from now on as you engage these topics. Also, I want to add that as someone who wrote me about a previous talk put it, um, I'm trying to explore these topics more as a teacher but not as a preacher. I may slip sometimes, but that's my intention at least. Uh, I'm offering perspectives related to moral conduct as a pragmatic vehicle for your own personal practice in support of your own personal happiness, increasing happiness over time. And it's certainly up to you to decide what to consider, what to take, and what to leave uh, from what I say in your own journey in this life. Tonight, from time to time, I'll slow down for your own reflections about all of this, including the applications for your intentions for 2022. These can be charged topics, especially tonight when I'll be talking about COVID and this plague and things like vaccinations. These can be very charged topics. I encourage you to observe the reactions arising in yourself and to be mind, to be mindful and kind toward these reactions and toward yourself. Also, try to be kind to other people who you may not agree with based on things they put in the chat sidebar. I also strongly encourage you to stay focused on your own practice, fundamentally your own practice, and not, as I've said, advise or criticize others. Okay, here we go. Now I'd like to explore the COVID plague. And I'll use the term COVID just as a simple, easy to use term. Uh, for all of this, I'd like to explore the COVID plague from the perspective of virtuous conduct, and particularly that aspect of virtuous conduct, which is not harming others, in particular by externalizing our costs upon them. That's going to be my focus tonight. This is a very, very charged topic for many people. I strongly encourage you to stay focused on your own practice with your own mind stream and not get caught up in the mind streams of others. I also encourage you to keep this at the level of personal practice. That's where I'm certainly gonna stay and not get into questions of public policy here or the history of the last few years, the various political parties, or the details of public health messaging. I will occasionally state things as a matter of fact. My sources include widely available information in scientific journals, the consensus views of most scientists, physicians, and public health officials, and summaries of all this in high-level news sources such as Reuters or the New York Times. I am not going to get into arguments about the views of a tiny minority of scientists, physicians, or public health experts. And I am going to keep moving along and ask you to bear with me as I talk through a significant amount of material that I've prepared for for us all tonight. I've given this a lot of thought and I hope it is helpful to you. We are recording this. Uh, we'll be eventually also fairly soon posting my notes, which are pretty detailed, and 
that'll give you a chance to look back at this material uh, if you care to do so. Okay, here we go. I'd like to start first with what has been a real drag <laughs> over the last two years, to put it mildly, or in the fancy word from the Buddhist tradition, dukkha, or plague dukkha. Dukkha uh, is the Pali term, the language of early Buddhism, for what the Buddha points to in his first noble truth, the noble truth of dukkha, typically translated as suffering, but better understood in an expanded way as including stressfulness, painful emotions like fear, anger, sadness, and feelings of inadequacy or shame, unsatisfactoriness, disappointment, frustration, irritation, contraction, friction, and just plain old unhappiness. That's the territory of dukkha. Since COVID, the simple word I'll keep using here, began spreading around the world in late 2019, just two years ago, um, it's brought a lot of dukkha for many, many, many people. Slowing down, as the Buddha taught, to acknowledge the suffering in oneself and acknowledging the suffering in others is important in its own right. It's ennobling, and it's certainly a good foundation for considering virtuous conduct. So I want to take some time to take a breath and just acknowledge how hard it's been for everybody, in, in, and really hard for many people in particular. For example, in America, COVID has killed at least 850,000 people so far. And we're currently, in mid-January, averaging about 1,800 additional deaths each day. Now, that means that while I've been speaking here and while you've been listening here and engaged with this, people have died while we are talking about COVID. This is just in America. Worldwide, it's killed about five and a half million people so far. And these numbers are probably low-end estimates because of issues with record keeping and the desires of some governments to suppress the numbers of COVID deaths in their country. Additionally, continuing Duca here, COVID has indirectly led to many other deaths by clogging healthcare systems and leading people to defer needed treatments. In addition to the deaths, other physical health dukkha from COVID include hospitalizations, long COVID, which ballpark is affecting about 10% of the people who get COVID, sometimes in extremely debilitating ways, or a few days or weeks of what feels like a horrible flu. Tangibly, there is, apart from physical health consequences, the financial dukkha, typically landing hardest on the most vulnerable people of layoffs or other sources of lost wages and income. And emotional dukkha, intangible dukkha, poof, it keeps on coming, doesn't it? From so many sources, such as having loved ones get sick and maybe die, or at least worrying about this for them. Uh, we have acquaintances and friends who are immunocompromised. They're very vulnerable. It could go badly any day for them. Uh, we could worry about getting the illness ourselves, you know, like in the background sense of uneasiness or apprehensiveness. You pass people or you're next to people in close quarters. You kind of wonder maybe, whoa, am I going to get sick from you? What might happen here? Or how might I harm you? Uh, there are stresses. Just dealing with standard public health measures that have been used for centuries, going all the way back to the Black Plagues, plagues during the Roman Empire, et cetera, et cetera. Standard interventions for airborne diseases, such as distancing and masking, it's still stressful. It's a pain to deal with them. Being cooped up with children, home from school, day in and day out, really nice in a lot of ways, kind of stressful for many people in other ways. Uh, being cooped up with your partner or your roommates because you're working remotely. Being unable to do the things you used to enjoy, things that maybe help you maintain your emotional balance, like going to the gym or hanging out with friends at a local restaurant. Uh, getting angry with people who don't see things the same way you do. That's Duca. Anybody besides me? occasionally experience that kind of dukkha. And then there's just the sheer grind of this wearing on and on and on, particularly 
And when we started to hope toward the end of 2021 that we were starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel, which unfortunately turned out to be the Omicron Express rushing at us full speed. Phew. So many things, and I'm sure I'm leaving out a lot. Uh, the Buddha said, in effect, that it is ennobling to face the truth of dukkha. It's ennobling. So let's take a little time here just to acknowledge how much dukkha you and others have suffered. Kind of bound to it. Perhaps with a soft thought in your own mind. May you not suffer or simply a compassionate and respectful bow to all the dukkha, all the suffering and harm that this plague has led to at home and around the world. It's been tough. It's been tough for everybody. It's okay to acknowledge that. It's okay to acknowledge the weariness that this is grinding on. Next, I want to also lay another kind of foundation for what I want to get into tonight by just talking about how hard it is in during a plague to act virtuously. There are certain very specific challenges to virtuous action and virtuous conduct, and even just thinking clearly about how to not harm oneself and others that happen, that are in the nature of a plague. So I kind of want to go through this and acknowledge these difficulties in acting clearly and thinking clearly during this time. First, the danger is usually invisible. He can't see a virus coming. You know, you can see a tornado coming. You can see an angry person coming at you, you know, with the intent to do harm. But the virus, it's invisible, basically. And we often don't know if we are infectious or if somebody else is. They don't even know it yet, oftentimes. Second, the risks are not clear cut. Some people get COVID in one strain or another, and they hardly notice it, if at all. It's not relevant for them. Others acquire long-term health issues. Many people die of this disease, five and a half million worldwide at least so far. These risks are in turn affected by other factors, including the uh, com comorbidities, such as being immunocompromised. Sometimes comorbidities are not apparent. How do you judge that risk? They're not apparent in others or even in yourself. You didn't even know about it until they make COVID, um, a case of COVID a lot worse. In general, risks are hard to think about. Uh, I worked for a year with a mathematician, for a mathematician, doing grunt work uh, in my late 20s, uh, and the mathematician did probabilistic risk analyses. His name is Stan Kaplan. If you're out there still, Stan, this is a big shout out to you. Wonderful boss, and wow, did I learn a lot there. And you really learn that risk is a combination of probability and damage, the two together, okay? For example, um, you know, uh, probabilities are probabilistic. They're not certain. They're not either or. It's These days, it's a matter of increasing or decreasing the likelihood of some kind of damage, not being a yes or a no. We like yeses or nos. It's simple. It's concrete. Do this. Don't do that. Guaranteed good. Guaranteed bad. No. No. It's more a matter of increasing or decreasing the chances of a bad outcome. Also, low probability events. You can dodge 100 bullets and the 101st will catch you. Low probability events can still cause a lot of damage. For example, the probability of dying from COVID is very low in children, yet it is still killed over 1,000 kids in America alone. In other words, the relevant facts, just the facts, are inherently uncertain, complex, and changing. And then making matters worse, there has been, hasn't there been, a tremendous amount of misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, and frankly, bad faith bullshit over the last several years. It's muddied the waters further. 
If a person gets their information mainly or entirely from highly selective and politically motivated sources that are not subject to review and fact-checking, or a person gets their information simply from the seemingly intelligent rants of Uncle Bob on Facebook, that person is likely to be understandably confused or plain wrong uh, in their views. Happily, it's really not that hard to find out or confirm important facts in a few minutes on Google, usually 10 minutes at most or less. As I have, you can turn to information widely available from major university websites. You can cross-check and double-check something that doesn't seem true at first. Uh, you can get great information from Wikipedia that's continually kind of crowdsourced and vetted. Um, you can get information from articles in scientific journals uh, for a general audience. They're very readable. You can read them. They're clear. The headlines are sure clear. Um, you can get good information from fact-checked publications like major newspapers and also information from major medical associations. Sure, it's not perfect. No one is without some kind of bias, including me. Even with the best of intentions, some things always get left out. We're in a plague, and things are a matter of more or less, not all or nothing. With a few minutes of effort, you can learn a lot more and make any confusion a lot less. Continuing with what's challenging, the costs of measures to reduce risks are usually concrete and immediate, and they're in your face. While their hoped-for benefits are typically in the future, and often in the form of something not happening, and absence rather than presence is really hard to see. Further, the harms that we might pass along to others by infecting someone who infects someone else, et cetera, et cetera, are often impossible to know. All of this makes it difficult to stay motivated to bear the immediate costs of useful ways of acting, virtuous conduct, for vague, uncertain, and deferred benefits into the future. Further, another challenge, and ask yourself, to what extent have you been affected by these challenges? How can you take them into account? Because we're vulnerable to this disease, because we are highly connected to other people, we must work to together to deal with it. And working together is challenging under the best of circumstances. It's hard for any of us to recognize our interdependence, which is one of the central teachings of Buddhism and one of the central tenets of standard public health. Working together is especially challenging on top of these general difficulties. Working together is especially challenging in cultures such as America that prize hyper-individualism. And also in America in which for the past 40 years, there's been a sustained attack on the very notion of the common good as well as a sustained attack on policies and institutions that focus on the common good. On a related point, in a culture that prizes personal convenience and the rapid gratification of personal desires, it can feel like a particularly high price to pay to adjust or curtail your behavior to reduce potential harms to other people. And last, isn't it tiring to still be dealing with all this? That makes a challenge dealing with all this after two very long years. People get exhausted and fed up. I get it, I feel that way sometimes. Uh, the costs of this plague to themselves, including the burdens of not harming others, are painfully obvious and have been steadily accumulating. The brain gets sensitized to stress and pain and increasingly reactive to it. And there's a natural tunneling of vision when we're under chronic stress that brings the focus closer and closer and closer to ourselves and away from others. So it becomes harder and harder to consider them, naturally harder and harder to consider them and hold them in our heart. In sum, we've got problems. We've got some challenges. All right. Now I want to kind of get into the heart of the matter here. During a plague, there are two kinds of harms, harms to oneself and harms to others. For example, getting COVID is a harm to yourself. 
and a particularly serious harm for many of us. Not engaging in enjoyable or important activities is a harm to oneself. Wearing a mask, especially in certain situations, is a drag and can be experienced as a harm to oneself. Having a needle stuck in your arm is a harm to oneself. Side effects from a vaccination are a harm to oneself. We could list other harms to oneself during a plague. I'm not trying to evaluate which harms are the worst ones. People can disagree about how big a harm is or why it happens or how to avoid it, and I'm not going to try to resolve that here. Meanwhile, there are harms to others. Harms to others including include passing along the coronavirus to them. Maybe they become asymptomatic. Maybe they feel sick for a few days. Maybe they get long COVID. Maybe they need to be hospitalized. Maybe they die. Or maybe they pass along the, res- the virus they received to others, who pass it to others, who pass it to someone it kills. These are simple facts. These are the simple facts of a highly contagious plague. It harms others to burden doctors, nurses, and other healthcare workers, sometimes to the point of killing them with this disease. It harms others to overwhelm hospitals and other healthcare settings. It harms others to clog the healthcare system and block their access to medical treatment for other issues. It also harms others to close their workplace and put them out of a job. It harms teachers. It harms children to keep them out of school. It harms teachers to open schools without adequate ventilation and other working conditions that would protect them from the COVID passed along by highly infectious children. It harms people to close the gyms that were a major source of mental and physical health. It harms people to force them to wear a mask when they don't want to. Lots of harms and complicated ones. And I think it's important to be respectful of harms as they are experienced by others, even if we don't experience them as harms ourselves. We each make choices about risks of harms to ourselves. These are often complex choices, weighing different kinds of risks, some immediate, some long-term. These can be tough choices, and I'm not going to judge them, and I'm not going to focus on them here. Instead, I'm now going to focus on risks of harms to others. That's my particular topic, specifically the harms of them getting COVID. I understand reservations about vaccines. I understand critiques of big pharma, mistrust of big medicine, and the valuing of holistic health. I understand these because that's how I see it too. I understand frustrations with evolving public health policies and confusing messaging, dislike of masks, and irritation at mandates. I feel the same way. I've written about this pretty extensively, actually, and I'm going to post in the chat the link to where you can find that if you're at all interested in it. From the standpoint of virtuous conduct, there are people who do not want to wear a mask or get vaccinated for personal, sometimes health-based reasons, and who are also extremely careful about not infecting other people. The principle of not harming others is important to them, and they walk that talk. Further, we must balance reducing harms to ourselves with reducing harms to others. We weigh that, right? Duty to self alongside duty to others. It's not either or, it's how do we balance them? There is no way around this balancing act. How do I balance harms to me, harms to you? How do I balance benefits to you, benefits to me? While taking others into account, sincerely into account, a person could carefully decide to reduce a harm to oneself while knowing that it could increase potential harms to others. These are complex, difficult choices, depending on very real situations, and I respect people who consider them thoughtfully while holding others in their heart. And there are people who do not consider how their behavior 
could pass along COVID to others. And as best I can tell, some of these people basically just don't care. It's not their problem. But then their behavior creates problems for others. With a highly infectious and often serious disease, if someone doesn't want to pay the costs of considering their impact on others and getting a bit informed about how COVID is transmitted, then those costs are externalized onto others who now carry a higher risk of getting this disease. It's a fact. If someone doesn't want to pay the emotional and mental cost of compassion, of recognizing our interdependence, and of taking others into account, then the consequences of not paying those costs are pushed downstream onto others by making them more likely to get COVID. More specifically, there are the people, there are people who don't like the hassles, et cetera, of social distancing and wearing a good mask in indoor settings that is properly fitted, not dangling below their nose. They don't want to bear those costs. I understand those costs. I don't like them myself. <laughs> but it's really a different matter if we just push them downstream onto others. Since social distancing and wearing good masks in indoor settings clearly reduce the, li the risks of getting COVID, since social distancing and wearing good masks in indoor settings clearly reduce the risk of transmitting COVID, not perfectly, but still substantially, anyone, anyone, I'm gonna put the link in there, anyone who does not wanna pay that cost themselves transfers it to others in their now increased risk of getting COVID. Let's pause for a moment and consider side by side two kinds of costs, right? The costs of wearing a mask, right? Next to the cost of getting COVID. And remember that if your actions give someone COVID through that person, you are probably also infecting numerous other people as well. Cost of wearing a mask compared to the cost of getting COVID since someone did not wear a mask. Hmm. How do they compare? There are also people who do, who do not want to be vaccinated against COVID. As context, two things. First, two shots plus a booster are highly effective against hospitalization and death. Over 100,000 Americans have died from COVID in just the past few months, almost all of them unvaccinated. Similarly, the people who have been hospitalized for COVID are also almost entirely unvaccinated. Further, two shots plus a booster reduce the risk of getting and then transmitting this disease at all. It's not perfect. There is no perfect during a plague. But this level of vaccination clearly reduces the spread of COVID to others. Finally, even if someone has had a case of COVID, also getting vaccinated reduces their risks of contracting COVID again, particularly from a new variant such as Omicron and transmitting it to others. Serious side effects from the vaccine do occur. They matter, they're real but they are rare. As you can see in this summary from Johns Hopkins University that I just put into the chat. For most people, the vast majority of people, the side effects of the vaccine are brief and mild. By comparison, the side effects of getting COVID for unvaccinated people include serious risks of hospitalization and death, as well as the risks of passing along COVID to others. Now, the reasons vary for not getting vaccinated. As I've said, some people, including people I uh, respect highly and, and know well, have clear and understandable physical health vulnerabilities. And netting out multiple considerations, they've chosen to accept the heightened risk of getting COVID. I get that reason. Other reasons. There are a lot of them, aren't there? Other reasons include disliking shots, 
fear of doctors, anger at pharmaceutical companies making profits from vaccines, beliefs that we should just use natural treatments. Other reasons include anger at government officials telling us what to do, ideas that a conspiracy is hiding the true risks of vaccinations, or fears that Bill Gates has put nanoparticles into the vaccine. Some say that we have decent treatments and that's all that's needed, setting aside the fact that there are typically periods before treatment when a person is infectious and often doesn't know it. There are notions that the RNA vaccines are not real vaccines because they work by tricking our cells into mimicking the spike protein on the outer shell of the COVID virus, thus prompting the body to build up an immune response to it, rather than traditional vaccines, like for smallpox, that work by giving us a weakened form of a virus or other pathogen itself. Well, whatever you want to call these medicines, they have saved millions of lives worldwide. For many people, their reason for not getting vaccinated boils down to a matter of allegiance to one political party and opposition to the other one. It's a matter of tribal loyalty, fundamentally. And some people, for narrow selfish reasons of personal gain, have used their platforms to oppose or cast doubt on vaccinations while quietly making sure that they get all the up-to-date shots themselves. I'm not going to respond here to these various reasons. As I've mentioned, I've written about many of them elsewhere, and you can go to the link that I've put already in the chat, and I'm going to put in the chat again here. And I want to make the point, too, that's a really important point, that I know many sincere, good-hearted, well-intended people who've had some or more, some or more, of the reasons I've stated so far for not getting vaccinated. They're sincere. They're good-hearted. They're, they're, they're thoughtful. They're grappling in, with the complexities of all this in the face of all the challenges that I've talked about. I, r- I really want to acknowledge that. I get that, all right? All that said, all that said, in my view, personally, Other than significant health risks, such as being immunocompromised, my personal opinion is that the various ostensible reasons for not getting vaccinated are, in most cases, minor, irrelevant, ignorant, ridiculous, or malicious. All that said, here's the key question. If a person has chosen not to get fully vaccinated for whatever reasons, and it could be excellent reasons, deeply considered, for whatever their reason might be, what are they also doing to reduce the risk, to reduce the risk of giving COVID to others? That's the key question. It cuts through to the heart of the matter of non-harming. What are they doing? to avoid harming others? What are they doing to avoid externalizing the costs of their personal choices onto others? That focus. Anyone who tries to evade that question, whether by changing the subject or denying the science or attacking the messenger, is participating in harms to others. Face the question, personally, with others, on TV, See what they do. Are they facing the question? When various politicians or pundits advocate their preferred policy, it's striking how often they leave out the risks to others of getting COVID. They just leave that out. It's like they want to wave their hands and deny the very question of impacts on others and downplay or poo-poo the very idea that we depend upon each other and have responsibilities to each other. I am saying all this, which might already be so painfully familiar to you that you're starting to tune out, to highlight the moral dimensions here and to put them in the conduct, the context rather, of virtuous conduct, of non-harming, 
of not externalizing costs upon others. For yourself, what is your own sila, your own virtuous conduct during a plague? What's it been and what is it currently? In particular, what is your care and concern about your impacts on others? If you look at your conduct and it feels virtuous to you on the whole, maybe some little tweaks here and there, but on the whole, yep, the Buddha recommends and other, other teachers do as well, that you find gladness in your own virtuous conduct. It's okay to find gladness in your goodness. And on the other hand, if you see in yourself a, a lack of caring about others, or simply an ignorance or a thoughtlessness about your impacts on others. The Buddha and other great teachers recommend that you feel some concern about that and a commitment to a higher road. When you consider your own life these days and in the year to come, are there any adjustments related to COVID that make sense to you, including in light of what we've explored tonight? Further, what is your view, your moral clarity about those who externalize the costs of not getting vaccinated and not wearing masks upon others? It's okay to have moral clarity, including about other people. Obviously, be wise about it. Still, just because we need to avoid the pitfalls of righteousness and hostility doesn't mean that we should not have moral clarity. If we see someone dumping garbage in the street, we should have moral clarity about this. It's an obvious harm to others. Similarly, if we see someone flouting standard public health guidelines in ways that harm others, we should have moral clarity about that as well. I know I've covered a lot and stirred up a lot of stuff that we won't have time to process fully tonight. And I look forward to talking with you more about this next week. And to repeat, I will read all the chats, uh, definitely. To finish here, kind of moving out to the big picture, I'd like to mention something that I said last week. So many of the great issues of our time involve an overdue reckoning with externalized costs from the few upon the many. Recognizing these harms and telling the truth about them to oneself and to others is an important step in reducing them, and thus an important aspect of your sila, your virtuous conduct, and your own psycho-spiritual practice. This recognition can also have ripple effects in the wider world. The great positive developments of our time have come from this kind of moral clarity. In my opinion, Virtuous conduct expresses itself in doing what we can this year and every year, personally and at larger political scales, to oppose the people and the organizations who are, in effect, in all kinds of ways, dumping their garbage in the street. It's okay to name this. It's okay to talk about it. You know, it's not a taboo. It's not something that we should leave out of our personal practice and the field of our awareness. For example, there are multiple accounts in the Buddhist tradition, and you can find many of these examples in other traditions and in the world today, many examples of people deep in their practice, saintly even, individuals who calmly confront rulers, often at great personal risk, calmly confront rulers with the harms they were doing to the common people. As you may know, usually I focus on the personal level of intervention. And I'm going to continue to do that in the year to come. Fear not. And as we enter 2022, which in America and worldwide is shaping up to be a key turning point for better or worse, it seemed appropriate, as I have tonight as well, to highlight the broader implications of virtuous conduct. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your practice. Thank you for your own virtuous conduct. And thank you for taking into account others and being thoughtful about your impacts on them as you make 
your own well-considered personal choices. Really, thank you. How about we just sit for a minute, kind of gather ourselves, be aware of your reactions, all kinds of reactions maybe, to what I've talked about tonight. And see if you can just let your reactions be in a larger space of kindness, simple kindness, kindness toward yourself, kindness toward others in your immediate circle, kindness to others in the wider world. It's been a really hard couple of years. It's really challenging to think clearly and act skillfully with all of this, including the coronavirus. It's been hard. And I just hope that what I've talked about tonight has been helpful for you in some way. 